the, the agenda a little bit. Um, we've got me and we've got Diggy Hello. here um, who's going to also talk to you guys. Um, but I usually work better off the cuff than giving you guys a pre-recorded speech. So what I'm happy to do is open to questions and then or topics. If you want me to rant about something in particular, um, I'm happy to, to give my thoughts. Um, but ultimately, I will turn this over to you guys to kick the, the conversation off and then... Um, then I can uh, talk about whatever you, you want to know. So are we start, are, okay. I have a, a just a quick update for you, Adam. This is Sidearm talking. Um, yep. You you met uh, two weeks, three couple weeks ago, uh, Marie Vance from Colorado State, who is teaching the first ever systems engineering course in virtual reality educational design, and uh, they will be visiting Science Space uh, next week. Uh, no need for staff or anything like just just FYI and um, I talked to her they are this will be the seventh of eighth virtual worlds they will be wearing one person with no VR headset one person with a yep. quest headset one person with a mixed reality headset one person with a vibe headset one person with a valve and full body tracking headset and three others who she doesn't know what they're bringing yet so talk about an acid test it just kind of made me grin a little bit um i've yeah, already I'm i've already advised the, her file. advised her not to that it doesn't quite work everything but she already knows that it's no surprise to her every virtual environment she's going to you know so I yeah yeah unfortunately the the vr support we've been pending on our unity 22 upgrade to really do do a full work over of that one that's that's uh, joshua's department actually uh, maybe we could get to bring him along um, next time I do one of these, uh, so he can talk apparently, to a bit about, the, bit about that quest, stuff. The Quest 2 has been broken as well, apparently. Um, Carson's oh, been again? reporting it. All the controllers are broken on it. Uh, is that on the live one, or is that on the preview one? On every viewer, I think. Carson, um, what, what viewers is it on? I know it's on the um, Superlight. The other thing that I just mentioned that is... Uh, catching my interest because you know this is my research area of those students these are all people that are working for a living i mean they got their undergraduates a long time ago they're coming back to do masters and phds to use virtual reality slash metaverse including desktop obviously so at the yep. moment the newbies in her group are going to probably end up using mozilla hubs and frame for their educational project the Valve guy with full body tracking will probably do VR chat for his environment, and the rest of them are likely going to use spatial. So those are the other key uh, environments that Marie's got on her list. But remember, this is a two to four year pilot program that she got approval for from her vice president. So, you know, down the road, she's keeping Science Space on her list because uh, <laughs> it, it does both desktop and headset VR over yeah yeah the, the, i mean we, our focus has, has traditionally been on the more flat screen environments just because vr is not terribly popular yet um when you look at the, the audience statistics there is definitely a growing growing niche of uh, people who are interested in in vr headsets um and access the environment with them but um from all the, the data that we sort of see and research and so on still very very small compared to the people who are going to be accessing desktops and phones, which is really where, where a lot of our, our effort is going towards. Diggy, I don't know, are you planning on presenting any of the, the design stuff um, this week? I'm not sure what your, your uh, focus yeah, is Yeah, I was going to show what we have done for the orange wear a bit. Brilliant. All right. Well, yeah, that's that's good to see. So um, I think I've mentioned this before in our previous um, previous one that we're sort of color coding the, re the reviewers. So um, the one that's out right now is red, the next one's orange, then there's yellow and, and so on and so forth. And um, yellow is the one that's got the 2020 upgrade in it, but orange is one that's been sitting almost ready to go, but not quite uh, for some time, which is the, the super light preview viewer. Yeah, the other thing we're trying to do is we are trying to test it as much as possible so we have less hiccups on the lives um, and the product on live is well tested so it's easier for new users um, and with less bugs. That's why we are hesitant to push it to, to live yet because it has yeah, a huge we've got a... network stack and lots of new features in there. Yeah, we've got a freeze bug that we're tracking down at the moment, and that's the one that's holding up the super light viewer more than anything else, I think. 
Um, we've been trying to trace down exactly what can trigger it, but it certainly seems to be uh, that when, when it gets triggered, it really does lock up everyone in the region simultaneously. So the office managed to reproduce it uh, just yesterday. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get uh, get a good um, a good fix to that one in sort of two or three days. Uh, and then hopefully we can do another build and, and get that one out the door. Uh, it really is holding up a lot of other stuff as well um, with that particular viewer coming up. Uh, it's good to know that there is some issues with the with the Quest controller tracking. Unfortunately, um, our QA department's based in our Shanghai office, and uh, the Oculus Quest is actually blocked there, which is really annoying. Um, so they're having to use Vive for most of their um, Joshua maintains the the Quest support, so I might get him to have a quick look at that as well and just see if we can fix the, the grip and trigger. And, and... Well, yeah, Josh is already aware of this as well. He, he's oh, he is? Oh, brilliant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I made a ticket and assigned it. He asked me to make a ticket and assign it to him, but it was um, I told him while he was on holiday last week, so he hasn't had a chance to touch it yet. Well, I, I was kind of taken aback, uh, Adam and Zhu, by talking to Marie at the variety of headsets her students are bringing with them. And, and the issue with, with Phase Zero VR labs in universities is the students use their own equipment because of the lockdown. So um, number, and that's number one. Number two, she's into research. I mean, she worked for HP for 30 years into the VR division. She loves having all those headsets. I mean, um, but it took me aback because I've been assuming everybody's going to get a Quest and every decent platform should support Quest and everything will be hunky-dory. Yep. But with people like Marie around, uh, on the other hand... There's a lot of them. Uh, if you can actually see my my wall i can do a video share here so you'll get to see my oh get the right uh right device picked here webcam device let's switch that to that one there we are so you can see behind me over there i wasn't prepared to put my face on camera today so <laughs> special thing you can actually see that i have a wall of headsets and more behind me as well there's just so many that we have to support and they all work in different ways and uh, and misbehave in different ways as well um, which is always a bit of a bit of a pain point around the place. Um, if so you don't I'll mind, Adam, uh, I will ask you I'll, to send me a list of all the ones you have. Marie would adore that. Um, I'm not. I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah, it's all of the above, um, almost. The only one I don't have is a is a Valve Index because they won't ship to Australia. But um, everything else, I have one, uh, and we've got quite a few other people with uh, with similar collections and arrays. Um, but like I said, I think there's two to, two to four years to get VR headsets really being a thing. I'm I'm I guess I'm that's me feeling that. Yeah, the technical side is getting a lot more clean. But once we do the Unity 2020 upgrade, we've got a consistent interface to every device, and we're going to be looking forward to that because it'll make our life easier. Um, but look, I'm I'm open to we talked a bit, a bit about this at last um, last time I was around. So let's uh, let's move on the topics because obviously um, we've only got an hour and it'd be cool to, to jump around with a few things uh, there is some cool stuff coming down the pipeline which i can talk about uh, if that's what you guys are interested in um i'm currently working on and i talked about this in the in the um scripting chat on discord uh maybe two or three weeks ago uh, talking about um breaking our network protocol um i've got some some cool benefits of that coming out the pipeline now um, which I think might be um, interesting if people want to hear that. That's probably mostly relevant to scripters more than anyone else, but uh, still interesting um, interesting that we can uh, talk about. So if that's of interest to anyone, uh, pipe up. Otherwise, I'm open to questions. Okay, uh, that's I, a yes. I have a question um, of a moment. Yeah. Um, do, is there in place, or might there ever be in place, when we're uploading large files like a region, yep. Um, is it is there in place a pause upload, or if we lose internet connection, it would pause uh, you know, like an FTP resuming? program? Or... Yeah. So, so this actually ties into a little bit of, of what we've been working on. So there's a there's a very big change that myself and Joshua have been working on for for a while now. I've actually been working on it for about a year. Um, and this actually ties into to what I was going to talk about on the server side, so it's a, it's a neat, neat um, pairing. One of the problems we've got at the moment is the way we store object data. Um, the object data we do is stored in a very efficient format, so it's designed to uh, 
it's designed to be downloaded by the clients in a very optimized way. Make sure that we, we basically don't waste a kilobyte as uh, far as sort of driving the same, same contents. The problem with the way we pack this data is that um, because we grab lots of data all at once, it, um, it all has to be processed at once, which is why we sort of upload at once. We, re we process everything, export the files that we're interested those get sent to the client. The problem with that model is that um, while it's very uh, efficient, uh, it's not very uh, user friendly. And I, I could put that from two perspectives. One, it's from the perspective of people who are uploading content that you've got to upload huge, huge chunks of data. Um, and we, we do do that um, and we process it from there. But the other side is also scripters. Um, and we'll talk about that as well in a second. So one of the big um, big changes that we were we were looking at doing before the first first approach to this one was that we were going to have the processing servers store more more uh, data about what you're so that it could negotiate with the editor panel and say all right I actually only need the textures that are changed and that would give you things like resuming and faster uploads and sure region upload the whole lot of it um, the the problem is that um, with with that model is that it's it's still fundamentally problematic in that you've got long long times attached to everything you upload. Oh, we talked a bit about um, doing a revision of the processing servers that um, I talked last year about the or doing a change in the processing servers so that processing would take seconds rather than, than minutes um, to go through and even can take hours if you've got really big content. Uh, and that's actually what's led to what we're doing right now. So we've actually been splitting up the data and instead of us storing to one or a few big files that sort of efficiently compress everything and make appropriately in all the like, uh, instead of doing it that way, we're actually splitting things up into lots of micro micro elements that are defined in our own storage formats. Uh, and there's two reasons for doing that. One, it gives us a lot more stability on going between Unity versions. We don't need to do as much patching. But the second thing is that it's going to allow you to modify just tiny pieces of the scene simultaneously. And we can move more and more of this into the actual client rather than inside the editor pack. So it's going to be a case that you'll upload 3D models from the client. You'll be able to do everything eventually the editor pack. Um, but there's another side benefit. I've been been circling around this point. This is some loop light uh, changes that I've been doing has been actually um, making it so that the server, the region server that we've got is now completely and completely aware of every part of the scene. Um, that includes things like asset references, includes um, the actual state of the fair, what components they're going to do them. The really cool thing is that at some point, very, very soon, uh, we'll actually enable scripts on the server to modify the scene contents. So you will actually be able to browse the in server scripts and uh, do things more efficiently and make things a lot easier when it comes to updating persistent properties, doing things like signs where you're modifying the text on the sign. That can be done straightforward without any uh, database access. Uh, and obviously from editor's perspectives, it's going to mean that um, we're, because we're uploading smaller and smaller bits, those long upload times, will, um, there'll still be an intermediate changeover period where we're still using bits and both. But the, the goal of, of what we've been doing has been to make it much easier to have more dynamic environments, and it also lets us have, have much have much bigger environments too, so we can stream more content. Have environments that are <clears throat> taking advantage of some of did uh, two years ago on creating sort of what we call uh, giga regions, which are bigger than bigger than normal regions, and stream the content. That stuff all just has seamlessly transferred into what we're doing here. So there will be a very big update down the line. Um, I'm hoping sooner than later, but big engineering project that almost completely changes the um, back end works. And that's going to make life, I think, easier for everyone. And it's going to enable a whole whole host of uh, very cool developments that uh, scriptors are going to love and content creators are going to love. And I think that uh, it also means we can have much more in the way of regions that have got lots of owners working simultaneously, smoother, more efficient. Uh, we've got lots and lots of bits on the sidelines with this as well. We've got a new parcel system um, that replaces the room four system. Lots of things that we've been working on for, for quite a long, long time are all coming out as part of this sort of one big big update. And that'll be sort of drip fed over the next next couple of releases. First 
first stuff we'll see here will come in the green piece, and then there'll be bits and pieces coming in for that as well that uh, we're looking towards moving towards. So look, I've been chatting for about 20 minutes, so I'm going to pass over to Diggy, and then we'll come back and we can do you got some cool stuff to show off, I think. So. Yeah, so adding on to what Adam said, but we have a couple of things um, planned over the next couple of releases. So the way we are moving forward is we are trying to uh, get the items that are beneficial for first-time users and prioritize those UX and UI changes. And then moving from there, we are going to more advanced stuff. So just to show some of it to you guys, um, hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm now. Just, yeah. just for reference, your your mic is clipping just a little bit. If you maybe knock the sensitivity down by like ten percent, it'll. Uh, sure. Uh, is that better now? Yeah. Yeah, that is times better. What's up? Awesome. Well, the viewer yeah. loads quick on the Mac. <laughs> that was really quick. He has one of the new M1 <laughs> MacBooks. Yeah, and I'm it's running two of them. So this is our new um, login screen. Uh, you can see we have changed it to more full screen, so you can see the background image. Sorry? Yeah. You're still clipping a bit, sorry. Uh, maybe just don't talk to as directly in your mic. Okay. Um, is it better now? Yeah. 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 Um, so as you can see, we have redone the login screen, made it a bit more simple, and you can see the background images that will be changing. The other major change we did was on the registration process. Uh, previously, it was a bit old. Um, if we haven't touched it for a long, long time. We went and cleaned up the registration process. This is the new registration process. We'll be adding more default avatars over there. Um, much simpler, simpler, you can click on any avatar, continue to the next steps. Uh, the other major change we did was we replay, we added a new display name, uh, which is non-unique for the grid, which means a user won't have to sit there trying to guess a username that's available for the platform. There can be multiple same display names. The username, however, will be unique. Uh, what we'll be doing is first time uh, the username will be generated automatically from the display name, which is unique and the user can then change it once, and after that, they can change it using gold. If they're a premium member, they'll be able to change it using um, uh, every 30 days. So going back from there, um, I'm just going to log into the previous server so it doesn't kick me out of here. Uh, the other change we did was we are still in the process of this is redo the entire um, outfit window completely. So this is uh, the new outfit window. Um, you have presets already. Uh, in the initial version, the presets that we have changes both the body and the head. But what we are doing is um, from the feedback we got, we are going to split it um, body as a separate and face as a separate. So you can change either or. Uh, then you can go to customize section where you can uh, customize your avatar and wardrobe. So there's lots of cool changes on the outfit window that's coming. And we are also trying to improve the outfit window. Um, I can show you a couple of iterations. For example, in the previous one, you saw um, the entire customization as being one thing with a slider. Uh, we try to categorize it so it's easier to navigate. Uh, again, uh, like I said, face and body presets are coming. Uh, we are going to uh, convert into a tab. What we are going to do is when this design is complete, we are going to share with you uh, for feedback, and hopefully uh, we can get some feedback from you guys and then reiterate before we release the next version. Uh, the other update that we did on this was the network update. Uh, many of you should be aware of that and have tested it already. 
yeah, we've been there, but we did uh, last week's community hour on on Superlight Viewer. Okay, brilliant. And the other thing is, now that we started testing more in the community, we're finding stuff that we don't find in our other testing processes as well, because obviously the communities do different things. Yeah, so we did like um, a full overhaul on this outfit window. Uh, it's great to have some feedback and some um, when you guys uh, try it either on the previous server or on the live uh, when it's released. Um, do you guys remember what else we changed? Because I think that's all I can think of. We need to change the event window in this one. I can't remember if it was in this release or Which not. Which one? Sorry? Events. Mark's just asked about um, that, that now in the new one, you don't seem to be able to adjust the height of a full body avatar where you could on the old um, outfit window. Yes, that seems like a bug that we need to fix. Uh, there should be an ability to change the outfit, um, the full avatar. Yeah, yeah, we definitely should should uh, make sure that's there. Um, well, yeah. One of the things I can show as well, um, if you've got, if you're um, free, let me quickly pull my magical rotating display across. Give me one second, guys. I will show you something else that's uh, related to this these UI changes, and particularly why what's guiding some of the design decisions that are going on on the desktop one. Let yeah. me uh, quickly quickly rotate my webcam. Get itself. Right. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing again? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, this is obviously what I've shown before, and I showed this at office hours as well, but... Um, uh, I might have to get in here at the same time. I think I should be able to. But how this is going to behave with all these avatars in here, so this might be a case that I need to look to the preview grid, but um, find out in a second. This is obviously the um, the mobile version that we've been building. Uh, I don't know how clear that is. Do I need to do something to make that a little bit more visible? Let me just... yeah. Please uh, tell me in chat if that's uh, if that's sufficiently visible or not. Maybe... I can see it somewhat. Yeah, that's yeah. better. It's a little bit hard to see, so I might uh, we might be stuck with broad strokes views here, unless I can. Uh... I know it's the, the color is, is um, a bit washed out. It's always a bit hard taking pictures of, uh, uh, of uh, what we're doing there. So, uh, is that the mobile version? Sorry, I'm this is the mobile yeah. version. So this is running on okay. iPad. Oh, wow, cool. Um, so, I think with some luck. My avatar will log in here at some point. I think I'm connected to the same network. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Uh, Adam, can I ask you a question? I think I am. Yeah. Um, uh, if I have a touchscreen laptop and Windows 10, will the mobile version work on that? That is a good question. I but don't I know the it. answer to that one. Um, we've tried getting the mobile okay. uh, UI running on desktop, and there were some reasons. It's not a technical reason, but there were some programming reasons why that was misbehaving. Um, but I think it would actually okay. would be great if we could get the touch support because the UI is much more touch optimized. As you can see, you could sort of go from here to, say, the Explore yeah. window, which looks like this. And as you can see, it's a, it's a radically different design to what you're used to. So, all the bits and pieces that you're expecting do work. So I can, for instance, pull up the shop, see my avatar on the side. Oh, so it feels uh, that's not moving very much. Yes, you can sort of see. Very, uh, very basic there, but um, all those bits and pieces are there. So let's see what else can I show off. Um, but, uh, I have to figure out which bits are, are enabled in this build or not. Some of them. Some of the windows don't uh, don't work on this uh, version. Uh, let's see what else. Do you we got. zoom in and out Sorry. to your avatar with the two fingers, zooming in and out? Yep. 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 Uh, so yeah. it's okay. multi touch. Yep. Multi touch yep. first. If I try and navigate, and I'm just have to rotate myself around so we can both see the screen simultaneously. Um, 
Okay. All the bits and pieces are designed to sort of be fluid with a with a touch screen. But we used to have sort of two modes on our mobile build where you had to sort of toggle between screens, but it's now all been congealed into the one one interface. So bring these up. Is that an iPad that you have? Yes, yeah, so this yeah. is a, this is an iPad. Okay. Um, we, we are testing with our um, iOS and Android on this particular build, but uh, it's been a bit of a bit of a long long slog getting it to where we want it to. So um, I thought I'd show that one just because it is a it is a cool demo to do, uh, and it's it sort of shows where some of the UI designs are also leaning that we're trying to minimise the differences between. Between and also whenever we are doing a new UI design, now we are doing for both the platform. Like we are doing yeah. a version for uh, desktop and another version for mobile, so we can uh, yeah. make sure that the changes are there in both the platforms. That's really come yes. along. I mean, that's exciting. What, what's yeah. the chat window like on the mobile version? A, that is an excellent question because it does keep changing. Um, bring yeah. up. I've just this guy's still not finalized yet. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So this one, that's where it's currently at. It's, it's We've toggled between having a full screen chat and having not full screen chat. It's really difficult to tell on mobile which one's the better one. Uh, so clearly that one's, this one's much closer to what we've already got. But Yeah, that's okay on the see. tablet, but on the mobile... On a phone, it's, it's more diff difficult, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going... Principally for tablet first on the mobile builds, just because they have a little bit more horsepower and also um, they do. Uh, we have one more change on that chat window, Adam, um, that's coming soon. Uh, that's brilliant. completely well, overhauling the uh, chat system. So, this is just incidentally, this build I'm running here is the same one that's available in Discord. Um, so, if you've got an iOS device, you can, can use this same build. Um, it does seem to be uh, behaving better today than it usually does. So, that's a good sign. Um, but ultimately, uh, we are making some progress on that one. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any, any questions, comments? That's looking good. Yeah. Oh, right. I can say. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy it's to show coming. off any other bits and pieces as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's I've, one I've, more bits and pieces that's coming. I've soon. got a question. Um, we are still. Sorry, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I agree with Galen. That looks really cool. Um, kudos on that. And, you know, just full disclosure, I still am not quite seeing the demand, personally, me, to have interactive build on a mobile phone. But on a pad like that, that looks a lot very workable. That said, where are you guys going with this? Uh, Adam, you mentioned that mobile is your number two priority after Superlight. And do you guys, including Niji, is there a big market for this? Is, is your corporate clients demanding mobile? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's yeah. not so much the corporate side that, that wants mobile. Yeah, they'll take it. But um, mobile has always been sort of something we've seen as, as really must have for the for the public grid. Um, so it's always been very high on my priority, my personal priority list to try and get that one. Um, robust and behaving itself. Um, like yeah, if you look at the stats for Roblox or Minecraft and mobile, that's huge. Yeah, it's like 60% mobile. Um, this is quite cool. So, Diggy, this is the room editor. So, this is the first time I'm seeing some yeah. of this stuff too. Do, 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 it's not sure ready for feedback yet. We are soon going to reveal uh, it to everyone for feedback. Do, ro do <laughs> Roblox and serious. Minecraft work on iPad? They do. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, they. One of the big problems we've had has actually been not so much the content itself, but um, some of the overheads that are attached to it. So things like uh, Unity custom shaders and so forth are a real nightmare for mobile devices to support reliably. Too easy to write stuff that uses gobs and gobs of memory. Um, we have have a lot of things being worked on at the moment to, to really try and sort of nail that stuff down and make sure that it's um, workable. Well, this is quite cool. So I, I haven't... This is actually... Diggy's showing stuff that he hasn't been showing to me yet because it's still the design <laughs> phase. This is really fantastic to look at. Um, yeah, so our plan with this is as soon as uh, our designers are happy with this, we'll share with the community and internally for feedbacks, and then we'll work a bit more on it before we actually start building on it, just to make sure that we are happy with the room editor design and it's, um, it's good for the new user as well as existing advanced user. 
Oh, we're actually going to get access to the materials. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that could be really useful. Save a full upload just to, to change a material. Oh, that looks oh. nice. That looks much better. I see a, that's a scale widget. Yeah. A scalable yeah. cube there. That's yeah, rotate. The, the gizmos. But... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Look, at, mobile is is the big place to be. Um, it's very obvious when you look at look at the demographics that um, most yeah. people who are a little bit younger don't don't have traditional desktop PCs. Yes, you've got them among people who who are PC gamers, but um, and professionals, but you don't tend to see much in the way of sort of powerful powerful devices um, with with a lot of audiences these days. But people's phones and tablets are actually extremely powerful these days. Um, the iPad Pro is just as powerful as a high-end um, high-end laptop. Uh, they really are. I've got a lot of oomph underneath the hood. Uh, and there is plenty of other cases as well. And the, the reality is that the mobile chipsets are getting better at 40% per year, whereas the desktop chipsets have been sitting stagnant for the last 10, uh, and it will not be long before... You can't even get the desktop ch chipset nowadays? No, no, no. Intel's been sleeping at the, sleeping at the wheel um, on performing improving performance of their chips and nvidia certainly spent a while before chipping out the 2080 series i mean i think they spent like six seven years sitting on the, on the nine and ten series um, before before crunching out the new ones and even then the new new 20 and 30 class um gpus are only marginally faster than the, the 10 um when you're doing non-tra non-ray tracing work so i think that the the reality is the where we need to be and what we need to be focusing on is actually robust mobile support that um that's i mean it's convenient too i mean i probably i think when i'm on my personal time i've probably got my phone in my hand more than i do have a, and i think that's true for a lot of people so being able to quickly bounce yeah. in and out of world from a mobile device is, is an example of mine um yeah and it also makes it more accessible for people to connect with each other in the, uh, and connect with community yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Do you find do you have more success? Uh, it sounds like with the iPad than with Android tablets or phones. Yes. Uh, yes and no. Um, I am personally partial to the Android devices because that's what I use personally. But um, the generally speaking, the hardware under the hood of the iPads is a lot better. Uh, I would say that roughly speaking, there's a two times performance difference between Android devices and an equivalent equivalent priced um, iOS device. Um, Apple tend to put a lot more effort into higher quality CPUs and GPUs in their mobile devices than most Android providers do. Um, even the sort of the flagship Android devices like the Pixel series tend to have pretty underwhelming underwhelming chipsets in them. Some of the high-end Samsung ones are pretty good though. The, the S20 and above are, are, are really great great devices from a performance perspective but ultimately if you're going to do a like for like comparison i'd say that the, the ios ones are generally generally superior there is some downsides though too uh, memory use on ios devices is a lot more restricted and that means that the sort of complexity of the content you can log and on um, as generally more available oh, to sorry, actually I missed running that last bit Oh, uh, Android's got generally got more RAM, which lets us load more content into into the into device and scene. Oh, okay. um, no, th there is sort of pros and cons for each. Uh, okay, so we are focusing on both. So, if we're thinking about investing in one or the other, just invest the one that we would in normally invest in and go with it. I would say if you if you're going out to get it for science space specifically, I'll grab an iOS device. Um, some okay. of the iPads are pretty good. Um, Look for the ones that Apple don't publish their specifications on their own website, but you can Google them to find out what the specs are. Look for the devices with more RAM on the iOS side. Um, most of the newer okay. ones are okay, but um, we are targeting roughly a four gig minimum, um, which means that some of the older devices, particularly secondhand devices, you're going to have problems with. Some of the really brand new ones, um, oh. more RAM is the better. Uh, 
the pros are fantastic, um, but obviously the pros are considerably more expensive than. Um... Yeah. Oh, you're cutting out. Um, uh, Adam, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, the galaxies are nice. I've just got one. It's a 12 gigabytes RAM on it. Yeah, yeah. No, the Android ones okay. tend to have lots and lots of RAM, which we love. Um, okay. More RAM, the better. Okay. That's good to know. Brilliant. Anyone got any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'm still stunned. You guys, that's the second week in a row I've been stunned. Um, this is cool that you're saying, I'm interpreting you both correctly, that you see a big market in the kind of Roblox Minecraft uh, popular uh, market for science space running on uh, pads, whether Android or iOS. And so you're thinking the, the pad format, right? Not the, not, not the small smartphone or even the note size, right? Although it would run, obviously it would run on a Note size or the Galaxy 22 Ultra or whatever it's called these days. Um, is that? Am I reading that correctly? You're you're seeing a good commercial well, market. It's it's a user interface question more than a more than a device question in particular. The user interface obviously does work better if you have a bigger screen size. Um, that's true because there's a lot of lot of detail that we need to put on. We are going to be working towards the smaller screen sizes as well. They're just as important, but they are a bit more fiddly and we need to do less at once. In mobile's UIs for phones, you have sort of one one thing visible at a time and that requires a sort of different UI language than it does for desktop and for tablets where you have a couple of things on um, and yeah, like you saw in um, Adam's example, the chat was visible on the pad, but if we put it the same way on the mobile, it wouldn't be really visible. So what we are nice. trying to yeah. figure, figure out is combine, unify the chat and fronts into one window. And maybe for mobile, for smaller screen, we will have to go for full screen for the chat. So user can easily chat and read the chat, because if you can't read the chat, then it'll be really difficult to communicate with the others, because not everyone likes to be on voice. And then I could I could see a beneficial crosstalk effect once you get the popular market humming along then your corporate market can just pick up on it because as as josh and les have told us endlessly you guys always have the same viewer that the white labels do and the white labels always have the same viewer that you do so that's kind of cool that's, exactly that's really cool and then yeah, yeah we're trying to avoid splitting out splitting our engineering efforts and, and doing things that, that don't benefit uh, the platform as a whole. That's always been a, a guiding principle of, of what we're doing with the corporate stuff is trying to make sure that we can um, we can backport or any useful useful fixes and changes. And generally speaking, I mean, I, I always think of the science-based client as a bit more like a web browser. There's, there's uh, your banking websites and you've got your entertainment websites and uh, it's the same software that's running both and that's where we want to head to. Yeah. And every feature that we are building, we are keeping in mind that we are building it for the platform. So we have to think about what kind of users will be accessing it. And we keep in mind that um, um, it will be our commercial users. It may be corporate users. It may be somebody else in the future. So we have to think about all those use cases and then design the UX and design the feature. So it's beneficial for all of them and in any platform, whether it be desktop or VR or mobile. Uh, we are also going to be doing VR UI um, after we have completed the mobile UI. Okay, and then one other question I'm thinking, and I'm trying to read Galen's mind and others. So <laughs> on, the, um, on the developer side, where we're building landscapes, and by we, I mean Galen, et cetera, and or building products for the marketplace, is there going to be, uh, do we need to do something different when we're building, or can we just keep building, especially when you get the new latest version of Unity running in the SDK, blah, 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 tech, tech, babble. Um, do, do we need to do anything different, like make lower megabyte regions or lower script load pro to run on the iPad version? Over. We do a lot of stripping automatically. And uh, once we get the, the big rewrite that we're currently doing on the back end, that's going to make it easier as well for us to do aut more automatic reductions of content and being able to sort of display what fits into the budget. 
Um, what you might find is that we've got some new new properties available um, on components for things like priority to define how sort of important an object is relative to the scene. So if we need to throw something away to save RAM, then the low priority stuff can go first. Um, that's going to be a little bit of a, a, a more tricky thing that we'll have to figure out. And but ultimately, no, the, the goal of what we're doing is to make it work with, with all devices regardless of what you're doing. Now that said, um, test content is really important. Uh, there was a case in study, and I'm not going to single out a particular creator, um, but there was a case study just uh, earlier in the week where some content was really lagging a region. And the reason it did that is, is using um, runtime reflection probes. It was sort of recalculating the reflection and baking at every single frame. Uh, and when you got a couple of those in the scene, it was really crushing the performance. That kind of thing can crush the performance of the PC and it can absolutely obliterate of, of smaller devices. But, but that does bring That's up one a, of the things that we do need. The, a good point. I hope that wasn't me who did that. No, it wasn't, it wasn't Galen. So that brings up the other point, which is if you have a really, really cool platform, which you do, which will now run on the mobile, which you're there, um, uh, but what are people going to come and do there? And, and, and that, assuming you're not going to try to develop it all yourself with paid sine wave entertainment, you know, gold standard programmers, you're, you're going to count on developers running on in because of the new platform. So where I'm leading is you'll have some guidelines for efficient building that will work on all platforms for all of us that we can go look at. Kind of, uh, what we'd prefer to do is see content that's it. really broken and then from that really broken content uh, invent <laughs> programmatic rules that kind of restrict that content from loading on particular platforms or behaving in a particular way on particular platforms uh, so that in the case of those reflection probes, it may be to do is simply disable support from runtime reflection probes on low-end devices. That actually lets you take advantage of the feature, but also lets us uh, tune the performance uh, impact to be more accommodating depending on uh, what devices you have. Again, if I use the web browser analogy, uh, a web browser doesn't get coded multiple ways for different platforms these days. It used to at one point in time. Nowadays, uh, things are coded so that um, they will gracefully degrade depending on uh, screen resolution. And it's the same sort of principles that we need to gracefully degrading content in the case of yeah. uh, hardware. Our, our... Can I just, ju Go just ahead. jump Go in here yeah. for one second? So I, can I just say something for one second? And that is that um, I don't know, when I make regions, I don't know about other um, builders, but when I do them, I don't really build specifically for VR or for mobile. Yep. anything like that and i have to admit it's because i don't have to i just check the box that says you know make this work on all these different platforms and i have been told that my regions look very nice in vr or they used to anyway um and i've looked at them in mobile and if they're set up for it they do look pretty well so whatever the process is whatever the processing is it's working very nicely so i appreciate that from a creator's point of view yeah, from a technical point of view, I'd say we're not completely there yet. We've done a lot of work on that, but I would say we're probably only 70% of the way um, to where we need to be for the for the adaption between various devices. There's lots of bits and pieces that, that we need to sort of chase down, like those reflection probes, for instance. We don't know about that problem until someone creates a bit of content using that, and then we suddenly go, oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense here. Um, so there's going to be a lot more cases like that that we need to iron out where broken content not broken content, but inefficient content. We need to work out how to, to port that to different platforms in a way to the experience. You know, this reminds yeah, for me. For example, uh, we have done. I was just going to tell you a true story. In uh, my mother told me she was considerably younger than I am, obviously. Anyway, true story. When they first started building super highways in the United States, they didn't know what to set the speed limits at. Now my mother told me this, so it's got to be true, Galen. And she said, so they didn't, they didn't set any speed limits. They just let people drive as fast as they wanted to. And then after a year or whatever the time frame was, they started setting speed limits based on the accident rates. Now country, I mean states like Montana, you can still drive 100 miles per hour because the state's huge because there's nothing around and it's straight. But, you know, if you're in West Virginia or something going around the hills, the speed limits reflect it. So it reminds me of that story, what you're saying. Well, let's just let people load content and then whatever tries to break the system, we'll throttle it. 
or deprecate it. Yep. But then you'll figure out what the standards should be. So that yeah. makes sense. You Over. won't know what's going to break either, will you? No, that's the thing. There's so many different ways that you can combine content in this platform that uh, trying to get ahead of that is just a, a lost cause. Um, I noticed Hinkley's asked a question about getting the EP tools to assess content performance. That's a good question. Um, some of the content stats that we provide already as part of the virtual good component, the clothing component, and um, scene component, there is some options there already which do define performance to some degree or another. But really, we want to get to the stage where creators aren't trying to squeeze every ounce of performance out of devices because sometimes those performances change dramatically. Um, over time, different hardware performs differently at different We um, use a historical analogy. Articles. Um, if you ever play an old PlayStation 2 game, you'll notice that all the Final Fantasy games use tons and tons and tons of particles and smoke and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then when you look at the next generation of consoles, the PlayStation 3, it just suddenly all stopped. Uh, and the reason for that was that um, the cost of rendering layered transparency, that is to say sort of a transparent object in front of a transparent object in front of a transparent object is what like heavy particle systems use. Um, the cost of that spiked dramatically on the next generation of hardware. So it turned out that stuff that performed well on the older hardware no longer performed well on the newer hardware. And that happens from time to time in different places. It could be texturing, it could be doing shading. Um, maybe stuff gets faster, like we get ray tracing acceleration. So really trying to predict how things are going to perform at creation time is the wrong move. What instead we should be doing is we should be maximizing the quality of up your, what you upload and then reducing that clock reducing that um, quality on the target device. So if particles are suddenly a lot slower, then maybe we change the particle system so less particles are emitted on those devices. Um, we try and sort of adapt it. And that way in the future, when another device comes out that looks um, can handle that well again, then, then that's um, supported. So really what we do want to do is we want to aim for a scenario where people aren't deliberately destroying their own contents, um, visual fidelity in order to match, match the target's devices because it's really the wrong way to go. What you just Brilliant. So, what, what you just did there was give a guideline for developers, which was right on. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's it's <laughs> going nuts. Uh, it's it's the opposite of a guideline. I think actually it's it's an invitation. Um, do we have a release date on Superlight? Yes, we kind of do. Uh, it's it's basically sitting at that last. Um, uh, well, let's talk about. I'll come back to that, Hinkley. Uh, one second. So, release date for Superlight. Uh, it's basically pending us finding and fixing a freeze bug. And I think there's one or two other small little bugs that are floating around as well. Uh, there's a bug where sometimes avatars disappear um, that we are also chasing. Uh, once those two are gone, then we are out the door. We actually would have had the Superlight viewer out like two or three weeks ago if um, if we didn't find those freeze bugs. Uh, so as soon as those are, are chased and, and out the door, then Superlight should be coming pretty soon. Um, Hinkley, on the philosophy of throwing stuff away, well, the answer is that stuff isn't thrown away um, in that particular scenario. So that's a competing platform in particular uh, has notorious uh, content that sort of has 20 million polygons being uploaded for a fingernail. Um, the problem with that particular platform is that the content is always displayed at the highest resolution. So it's always going to render that 20,000 poly million polygons. Whereas the approach that we're taking is actually to um, destroy the content at one time. So we, it never loads a 20,000, 20 million polygon fingernail what happens is see that we decimate it straight away and then we might do that decimation on the back end we might do it on the front end um, but the point is that um, we adapt the content from the highest source material it's the better best way to go um, <clears throat> and not rely on creators to optimize content because if, if actually this is the exact problem is if you rely on creators to optimize their content they won't um, there'll be market pressures that sort of lead to a failure of the commons and and various other problems where um, where it's all going to be abused from day one. We would rather assume that it's going to be abused from day one and, and handle it from there. I've got a quick question for Digi, which is, um, suppose, hypothetically, I had someone that I was saying you should look into science space for a, you know, account for your business to do stuff. Do I just send them to your website? Do I 
email you with their name, did you? I mean, what's the point of contact for a corporate white label client? Uh, for enterprise, I think either send them on the website or send them to our business development head, which is Georgina. Uh, yeah, yeah. So send to to um to them. There's a, a contact form on breakroom.net, which is actually probably the best place to get picked up by the the sales team. Yeah, um, they will reach out and they, it actually can let you book a book a call directly. Um, Diggy, can I ask you a question about the shop? Uh, yeah, is that sure. one of the things you are also still Absolutely. working on with the whole UI? Okay. Um, one of the things I I think this is true, or, or or maybe I noticed it incorrectly. Um, if I upload a an item and there are variations in it, and I upload some of the variations, let's say they're for this is normally what I do for the Christmas season, and then after the Christmas season in the spring I upload another couple of variations. I, I've noticed that the variations do not appear in the new item. You know what the newest items in the in the whatever the screen is, um, is that true or am I am I misunderstanding that? Because if it is true, I'm wondering if there's a way to get those to show. Because some of my um, some of my content has been around for a long time, and so the virtual good, I you know the curator ID is old, but I do every so often upload a new variation because of requests or whatever. And it, if it doesn't show as a new item, it would be nice if it did. I just remembered that just now. Yeah, I um, totally agree. I mean, if you're doing a content update, it should show on the new. Um, on the shop, what we're also doing is we're doing a complete um, shop overhaul uh, over the time. So we'll be doing redoing the UIs and redoing how the shop works and how the shop algorithm works. Uh, that'll come later down the line. Uh, it might not be showing because of a bug at the moment, maybe we'll look into it. Okay. Um, yeah, if there's something that's been going on there, I would potentially file an issue tracker ticket or just to the F5 report. Yes, please. But then I would yeah. definitely follow it up with uh, a message to one of us in Discord. I think okay. uh, uh, Zulane probably is the best place to, to find someone in the dev team to have a look and find out what's going on. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, Last question here, I think we'll take, uh, and then unfortunately I do have to go on the hour, so so we'll, we'll try to be here. Uh, getting previews on gestures, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Diggy, do we do we put that in the backlog? I think someone was working on it, it at is. one point. Yeah, uh, we it's know in when the that, backlog at the moment. Yeah, is it in? Is it scheduled for any particular release? Uh. I think it's scheduled with the entire shop overhaul because we need to add the preview system on the shop for just as yeah. such. Okay. I, I don't know what release that's in. Um but yeah, it's definitely on in the, the to in the to do list. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you if you if it is scheduled, uh, please feel free to tell tell which one it's been scheduled for, but um otherwise it probably will be in something like green or blue. I want to sneak yeah. in a last question, at least for Digi, Adam. I appreciate your time constraint. <laughs> and that is, um, again, I'm trying to read the mind of developers for the shop. Uh, recently, in the la last month or so, we here on the main grid have noticed that there's a lot of new products available, like some brand new full body avatars on the order of 20 gold, 20, whatever, 20, 20 bucks US. So, uh, and they're nice. They're really good. And then I think Zoo or Les or somebody said, oh, yeah, that's that's because there's now a plug-in to the Unity Asset Store. And so developers on the Unity Asset Store, blah, 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 can, you can now buy their stuff, which we had a lot of discussion on that. Um, so that's a whole new market for, for those developers. For those who are developing here, and we've asked this in the past, but the question is, we understand that your white label clients, if they so choose on their shop, can enable certain of the main grid developer products to also be shown there. Do you have a point of contact? Let's say I have somebody that wants to sell stuff to your corporate clients through your shop. Who do they contact? Um, that's a really good question because it's actually the review team who tags stuff. Yeah, there's there's currently four categories that we use for the white label stuff beyond the, the normal normal outlines. Um, 
there's a couple of broad rules uh, on what gets allowed to be sold and what's not. And this is not formally codified anywhere, but I can at least give you an outline on it. We'll have to go in three minutes, so I'll be quick. Um, rules number one is that it can't be too risque. Um, the, the public grid rule is MTV. If MTV can show it, we can show it. Um, the business client rule is not. Um, it's very it's much smart casual. So if it's if it's appropriate to be worn in a business setting, then that's that ticks that box. Then it needs to fall into a couple of categories. Uh, I think that there is sort of a smart casual slash business wear category. There's a fantasy category, which is pretty much anything almost, just as long as it's it's PG. Um, we've got. Uh, I think it's a low poly category. What's the last one, Diggy? Do you remember what the low last poly. one is? It's, uh, it's, fancy, no, smart poly. casual, business, and low poly. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think business is, is much more formal, so it's suits and ties and, and that kind of stuff. It always, always amuses me to find the, uh, some of our corporate clients just really insist on, on very, very uptight uh, clothing rules <laughs> in the virtual world, but uh, that's, uh, that's something that... Uh, <laughs> They, they know better than us. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but besides that, um, it gets picked up by the review team. So the review team automatically flags content that's appropriate, adds it to a tag, and then that can be sold on the, on the shop. If you've got stuff, um, I think I'm not going to open the floodgates to, to questions about this stuff to the review team because they're not prepared for it. And I don't want to make work for them on spontaneously, but I think that that's something else we should add to the backlog is the ability on Curator to see what your stuff has been tagged at if it actually does meet the guidelines. Maybe we can add a add an option for an appeal or something just to get the Oh, that would be nice. Checked. Yeah. So if it passes... Yeah, we can probably um, add an option on Curator as well for um, uh, for you, yeah. uh, for creators to apply to be shown in the break grade or want to keep yeah. only on the private Maybe grade. Maybe a box we can tick or something. You know, exactly. This is, this is this is you know. Please show this to reviewers for white label grids or whatever we think it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Brilliant. All right, guys. I've got a really dash because I've got a hard start in my next call, but um, it was great to see everyone, and I will be back. Um, Thank you, Adam. That was very same time next month. Thank both of you. Thanks, everyone. No problem. Thank you, Diggy.